Now, I would like to move on to our first panel of the day, a panel which looks at ways to implement climate solutions in cities around the world. Climate change is linked to inequality and social injustice. This is a growing awareness that climate change action is a powerful tool for all segments of a population to create wealthier cities. Sometimes the best place to begin this transformation is in our own neighborhoods or local communities. Let's hear from our panel about their vision for a more inclusive and resilient future. Join me in welcoming to the stage panel moderator Siam Jibril, founder of the podcast Generation XX. We can all give him a big hand. Mauricio Rodas, Mayor of Quito. Ivan Aki Sawyer, Mayor of Freetown. Laura Storm, founder of Regenerators. And Jean-Francois Decaux, co-chief executive officer of JC Decaux. Thank you for being here. Please welcome to the stage. Hello, everyone. My name is Siam. I'm the founder of the podcast Generation XX, and I'm very happy to be moderating this discussion. Um, today, we have an exceptional panel with us, so thank you for being here. Uh, we are with Mayor Mauricio Rodas, Mayor Ivan Aki Sawyer, uh, Laura Storm, and Jean Francois Decaux. So let's jump into it straight away to talk about how it starts at home. My first question is for Mayor Aki Sawyer. Um, we know that climate change often disproportionately impacts the poorest and minority communities the most. So what is Freetown doing um, to tackle this and build a more inclusive and equal society? Okay, thank you very much. Um, as you say, the poor, particularly women, are the most vulnerable. And the context in Freetown is that it's a city of a million, 1.2 million people, but it's growing rapidly. Um, we've, we're experiencing severe urban urbanization, 4.2% per annum growth. There may be up to 2 million people by 2028. The way that that translates into environmental challenges is because everybody who comes to the city is looking for a place to stay. Inevitably, that means pressure. Pressure on the hillsides as trees are cut down, pressure on the coastline as mangroves are destroyed, as the coast is banked to make way. The result is that Freetown now has 35% of our population living in informal communities, otherwise known as slums, 72 slums. They are the most vulnerable to climate change because when it rains and it floods, because the trees are no longer there to hold the soil together, when the sea level comes up in the rainy season, and we very, very tragically experienced on the 14th of August, 2017, a landslide in which a thousand people died in three minutes, directly linked to this activity. So what are we doing? I came into office nine months ago on the platform of the environment. I'm not a politician. I've never been in politics. But I was unable to stand by and see another election and see people running for office who didn't care about the environment. So I stepped forward and thankfully I won. And my... And my approach, or should I say our approach, because my approach has been to bring the city along with us. We started off in my first few months with 15,000, uh, engagement with 15,000 people one-on-one, -on -one, face to face in uh, town hall meetings. But we've also pulled together multi-stakeholder groups. So we've had 399 people from ministries, from departments, from development agencies, from NGOs, and most importantly, from community. And we have set out Transform Freetown. That's the plan. In four years, it's a four-year term. In four years, we will transform our city, and at the heart of that will be the environment. So what we're doing is when it comes to our 11 priority sectors, 
of which environment is number one. We're building resilience in communities. We're getting communities involved in risk mapping, in understanding their vulnerabilities, and in making specific plans to, to address those. But we're also, we also have a target to increase the vegetation of the city by 50%. Housing, which is a big driver. We're going to build at least 5,000 new housing units. That might sound like nothing to many people in this, in this audience, but for Freetown it's huge, because there's never been a building plan before. Urban planning. Very, very significantly, and I'll stop here because I know you're running out of time. <laughs> I'll stop here. We're also ad addressing solid waste management. Only 21% of waste in the city is currently collected. We've set our target to increase that to at least 60%, and to, by 2022, ensure that 40% of all our plastic is recycled. That is amazing. Thank you. Um, Mayor Rodas, what is Quito doing to involve citizens in your climate action planning, particularly those from poorer and more marginalized communities and neighborhoods? Well, uh, first of all, let me say that for me it's an honor to be able to share my perspective being a male mayor <laughs> on this Women for Climate <laughs> event. So I thank you for that. Um, well, first of all, I think we, we need to acknowledge the fact that women are not only the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change, but I think that it will be impossible to effectively fight against climate change without empowered women. I think that the women have the knowledge, the capacity, the strength to be a very, very effective um, actor in the fight against climate change. And I think that in order to empower women, we don't only have to do it on political positions, but also on the private sector, on civil society, and at the community level. Um, going back to your question, we are trying to address this through different programs in the city. For example, we have a program uh, on about urban gardens in the city. We have uh, more than 2,500 urban gardens producing organic, healthy food, through which we are addressing the issue of food security. We are ad addressing the issue of poverty reduction, because uh, the families that work on these urban garden, gardens are low-income families. But we are also addressing the issue of gender and empowering women for climate change action, because more than 90% of the people who work on these urban gardens are women. Uh, through the urban garden program, we have recovered more than 300 eatable native species in the city. Uh, this was part of the of the natural diversity in the city decades ago, and we are bringing back those eatable, healthy uh, species uh, for our urban garden program. We also have been working with uh, base recyclers. Um, a, they are not only recycling uh, waste under a sustainable parameters, but also they have developed micro-businesses to, to, to commercialize recycled products. So, and once again, more than 85% of these base recyclers are women. So I think these are two clear examples on how at the community level you can empower women, you can help them uh, increase uh, their, their income, but also you are providing them with tools, with very effective mechanisms to participate in the fight against climate change through adaptation and mitigation measures. That is great. Thank you so Thanks. much. Laura, you are one of those great women entrepreneurs, and I wanted to ask you, why is it paramount to have women at the table when designing and building thriving cities of the future? I think a lot of what I would have said has already been said beautifully by all the women and men that have spoken before me today. So I think I'm going to offer a different perspective because I think it's important that we realize that we are not going to solve the stress and friction we see in our ecosystem, in our social systems, among genders, by quotas and policies alone. It's also about um, another level of consciousness in a way. And I think it's important that we dare go to the root cause of our current suffering and the current friction we see in our cities and societies. And, and just an interesting perspective that not a lot of people are aware of is that in the Middle Ages, we had what is called the Little Ice Age. It was 80 years of extremely long, cold, dark winters. 
crops were failing, everyone was miserable. And um, up until that point, people had lived very in tune with nature. Women had see, been seen as being very in tune with nature. But from that point, nature and women were starting to be seen as, as an extension of the work of the devil. So we, the Pope issued the, uh, the Popal Bill demanding the, the witch hunt that went, went on for about 300 years. And I think understanding that separation between the genders and how women were pushed to the side, oppressed, suppressed, dominated, controlled, as were nature, is important for us to understand when we are trying to heal our societies, rebuild our societies, that it's not just fixed with a little quota here and there. It's about understanding what happened so we can heal that and bring the genders back together and, in, and seeing each other as equal partners in terms of redesigning thriving societies where ecosystems thrive and people come alive again. Definitely. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Jean-Francois, can you please share with us what are the products and the services <laughs> developed by JC Deco which contribute to tackle climate change within cities? It's we serve millions of people every day around the world. Um, and I would like to take three examples, which I think are very uh, telling about what the private sector can do for the climate change. We take a lot of pride with my brothers about the fact that we invented the free bike sharing system, which was launched in Vienna in 2003, 16 years ago. Climate change was not a topic, and a lot of people were very skeptical about our ability, mm -hmm. non-public transport company, to invent such a system. This has been a, a revolution around the world. And is every city now, more or less, as a bike-sharing scheme. So that was our first and most important product over the last 10 years, which uh, changed the life of uh, the cities, especially because around 15% of the people using the bikes would have used their cars if there hadn't been any bike sharing system. So this is a meaningful product invention from our company. The second example um, I would like to use is um, what we have done in Paris with our new bus shelters, which were installed in 2014. We reduced the electrical consumption by 35% by introducing LED um, backlighting, exceeding the Paris uh, climate change plan, which was uh, basically targeting a 30% energy reduction in Paris. And third example is we uh, operate the largest automatic public toilet system in Paris, also a product which was invented when uh, Mr. Chirac was the mayor in 1982. And we came up with the idea of using the rainwater uh, in order to reduce the water consumption which we need to clean the toilets after each use. And with this innovation, we are using now 45% less water to clean the toilets after each use. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Mayor Rodas, you recently launched a Women for Climate uh, mentorship scheme uh, engaging with bright young women in your city. What have you learned from your experience supporting this program and how will it lead to a more inclusive Quito? Yeah. Well, um, Quito was one of the first cities in joining the Women for Climate program, me mentorship program. Mm -hmm. uh, we started it uh, in 2018 we have more than 90 projects that were select, that were, were analyzed, and 10 of those were selected. Uh, actually, we just heard Liliana uh, talking about that. Uh, her, her project on uh, green roofs is one of those 10 selected projects. Uh, we have very, very high-profile mentors, uh, the former vice president of Ecuador, the former president of WWF uh, were among the mentors. And uh, these 10 projects in which we are working are really great. We have been uh, training um, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the women that work on these uh, projects, and um, we are about to begin the second phase on the program. We hope 
to, to have around 100 projects to be analyzed and then to select 10 more of them. And what we've learned is that there are great ideas in different areas, in different arenas, private sector, civil society, public sector, that need to be uh, visualized under a very optimistic lens. Mm -hmm and having the public sector, in this case the municipality, supporting them, providing them with tools in order to enhance their effect. Uh, we are learning new ideas, we are learning from innovation, and I think that these are initiatives that should be disseminated uh, through the help, in this case, of the public sector, but establishing a very broad partnership with different actors. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Mayor Aki Sawyer, could you share an initiative you're very excited about in your city and tell us what are some of the biggest obstacles um, to putting plants into action? Thanks. So we have, um, under the Transform Freetown, we have 19 targets and 37 initiatives. So that's a lot of initiatives to be excited <laughs> about. But the one that I'm really most excited about is something called the Cleanest Zone Competition. And the idea here is to bring this question of sanitation and the environment right into everyone's homes and to make it personal. So you're not seeing the, the benefit as something in the long term. There won't be a flood maybe next year, but something real for you now. Our city is divided into 322 zones. And what we've done is introduced a competition where every six months, and the first prize will be awarded on the 28th of March next month, every six months, we will go from zone to zone and look at how much you have improved in terms of sanitation and environmental support. So you get scores for overall cleanliness, you get scores for planting trees, you get scores for planting grass, you get scores for sustainability, so it's not one-off, and you get scores for innovation. So we do an initial assessment, we've developed an app for the teams who do go around the city, take photographs, fill out a questionnaire, we have judges, so we get the media involved and create a hype. And what really has made this so special is the prizes are significant enough to actually change the physical infrastructure of a zone as well as touch on things which women are particularly interested in. So you get four prizes if you win. The first, again, this is, you're in Paris, so these might not sound very special, <laughs> but trust me, they're special. It is special. So the first prize is 10 solar street lights, and you as the zone choose where you want them in your community. The second prize is a water point, so water, access to water is an issue. So you get a water tank, or you get a pipe, if, if you're able to put a pipe there. The third is where it gets very interesting. It's 250 meters of road, of paving, but that's made of recycled plastic. So it creates a circular economy. So we're creating the demand for the plastic and giving it back as prizes, and the youth who are in that community get to lay the road, so you're creating employment. And the fourth is education. So it's 10 scholarships for children, um, and those, in those schools, we're introducing nature clubs. So it, every six months, any community, no matter how poor you are, how dirty you are, you have a chance to win because it's not overall cleanliness, but improvement. So it's relative. That, I would say, is the initiative I'm most excited about, but there are lots of other ones. It is very exciting. Thank you. Jean-Francois, can you tell us how cities are actually integrating sustainability and climate change issues in their public tenders criteria, and which evolution do you see? I would say not enough. And we participate in about 250 tenders each year. Less than 10% include sustainability criteria. Best in class is Copenhagen, mm -hmm. which we uh, successfully renewed uh, three years ago, where 20% of the decision-making was based on sustainability. Two-thirds of which was about the operations during the 15-year contract, what are you going to do for climate change as a commitment, and one-third about electrical consumption, power consumption. So um, it's coming, but it's still very, very a small percentage of cities account 
uh, sustainability in their criteria. Now, many cities which we serve are facing a dilemma because we are providing a second, of, second to none um, maintenance program, meaning that after 15 or 20 years, the furniture looks like brand new. And private procurement means you have to change it, but not always. And I would like to give you one figure. If the city keeps the street furniture in place, rather than changing it, provided it's still functional, it's still looking good, they save 30% of carbon emission over 15 years. By leaving the street furniture in place, the 30% carbon emission saving over 15 years, which is very meaningful when you consider that you have thousands and thousands of products spread out of, um, throughout the city. Thank you for this insight. Laura, can you tell us a bit about your project, what you are working on right now, and how do you see the interplay between people and nature helping us create thriving societies? Mm. So when we redesign the, the societies that we all crave and long for, it's incredibly important that we look to the greatest intelligence in the universe, which is, in my opinion, nature. Nature knows how to purify water, turn sunlight into energy, create win-win partnerships, banks on diversity, I could go on. And nature has 3.8 billion years of R&Ds in terms of how to innovate and emerge new innovations and new solutions in a way. Um, cities can bank on that. Cities can draw on nature's intelligence. We can turn cities into thriving ecosystems. If we dare look at, instead of looking at silos and applying this mindset that we have had for many, many decades of this very rigid, reductionistic, mechanistic, hyper-masculine mi mindset, and instead apply a holistic, let's connect the, got, the dots, let's work together, um, just like nature does. How do we actually build thriving cities from the inside out, from the bottom up? And, um, and how can we learn how to integrate the intelligence of, of nature when we redesign the next epoch of human civilization on this planet? We need to ensure our civilization is life-affirming instead of life-destructive as it's been for the past many decades. Thank you so much. We have just one minute left, so to conclude, I would like each of you um, to share with us what do you hope cities will look like by 2030. Um, Mayor Aki, sorry, if you would like to start just a few words and then we can go on. Um, I think I'll pick up from where Laura left off. Um, cities which are actually working for the people um, and where people are thriving and there is resilience and there's hope for the future. For me, um, our, our, our mantra is transform Freetown, but that applies to everywhere. Great. Mayor Maurice Chavales. By 2030, cities should be the main drivers for the ESDGs, for uh, the Paris Agreement. Cities should be the examples that it is possible to effectively fight against climate change by providing a better quality of life for all, empowering women. Great. Laura? By 2030, cities are strong EP centers demonstrating how ecosystems can thrive, how people can come alive, and how we can do good business as well, because I think that's incredibly important. I spend a lot of time teaching business leaders in this new regenerative paradigm, and we need to make sure that we can all collaborate. And Jean-Francois, if you want to have the final word. 17% of the world population live in cities of more than 2 million people. They generate 40% of GDP and more than 60% of carbon emission. 17% of the population, 40% of the GDP, 60% of carbon emission. A city like Guangzhou, which is a member of the C40, has the GDP of Switzerland. A city like Shenzhen has the GDP of Sweden. I don't want to preempt what Mayor Rahm Emanuel from Chicago will say on the next panel, but mayors run the world. The ball is in your camp. And to finish, I would like to quote, quote Nelson Mandela, a very wise man. Action without vision is 
passing time. Vision without action is daydreaming, but vision with action can change the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.